Section 9 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 9. The Singer, by Wilhelm Hauff, Part 2. 4. When Dr. Lang came to see his patient that evening, he found her much better than he had hoped. He sat down beside her bed and began to talk with her about the unfortunate affair. She was resting one elbow on her pillows, while her delicate hand supported her beautiful head. Her face was still very pale, her great exhaustion seemed to give her but one charm the more, and her dark eyes had lost nothing of their expressiveness, nothing of the fire which had attracted the doctor, even though he was no longer in those years where imagination heightens beauty. He said to himself that he had seldom seen so sweet a face. Her features were not regular, but there was a harmony, a charm about them for which he could not find the reason at first. But his eyes, experienced in reading the soul, soon saw that it was the nobility, the purity of her spirit, which shed such a radiance over her virginal beauty. "'You seem to be studying my features, doctor,' said the singer, smiling. You sit there so quiet, looking at me, and you seem to forget what I have just asked you, or perhaps you do not wish to give the answer. May I not know what people say about my misfortune? Why should you wish to hear all the foolish gossip started by idle tongues? I was just thinking how pure your soul shines out from your eyes. You have found peace within yourself. What, therefore, do you care for the opinions of others? You are evading me, she answered. You wish to avoid giving me an answer by paying me compliments. Why should I not care for the opinion of others? What honest girl may dare to ignore the society in which she lives, may dare to say that it is of no importance to her what people say about her? Or do you believe, perhaps, she continued more gravely, that I do not care about the gossip because I belong to a profession in which the world has little confidence? Confess that you take me to be as careless as some of the others. Most assuredly not. I have never heard anything but good said about you, Signora Bianetti. What else would there be but good to say of your quiet, retired life, and of your calm reserve when you do go out into the world? But why do you insist upon knowing what they say now? As your physician, I may not think it is yet time to tell you. Oh, please, doctor, please do not torture me like this, she cried. I can read in your eyes that it is no good thing they say of me now. Do you not think that this uncertainty is far worse for me than the truth could be? The doctor saw the truth of this last remark, and he feared also that during his absence some gossiping women might intrude upon his patient and tell her worse things than he would say. You know the people here, he began. B is quite a city, but when an event of this kind happens we learn how provincial we still are. It is true that everybody in the city is talking about you now, but you cannot be surprised at that. And as nothing definite is known, why then, why, then they invent all sorts of things. For instance, this masked man to whom you were seen talking at the ball, and who without doubt is the person who committed this deed, they say that he is... Well, what do they say? begged the singer in excitement. Please tell me. They say that it is some former lover who knew you in some other city, and who tried to kill you because of jealousy. They can say that. Oh, how miserable I am, she cried in emotion, while tears shone in her beautiful eyes. How hard people are toward a poor, unprotected girl. But tell me more, doctor, tell me more. You are keeping something from me, I know it. What other city do they say was it that— Signora, I should have thought that you had more self-control, said Lang, alarmed at the excitement of his patient. In truth, I am very sorry that I have already said so much— I would not have said even this had I not feared that someone else might do so. The singer dried her tears hastily. I will be very quiet, she said with a sad smile. I will be as quiet as a good child. I will try not to think that all these people who are now condemning me were applauding me. And now tell me more, dear good doctor, tell me more. Oh, well, these idle tongues say stupid things, continued the physician reluctantly. 
It seems that the other evening, when you appeared in Othello, there was a strange nobleman here visiting someone in the city. He is said to have recognized you, and to have declared that about two years ago he saw you in Paris, in exceedingly bad company. But, dear me, you are so pale. No, no, the lamp is growing dim. But tell me more. This talk went about in the higher circles only at first, but a little later it leaked out, and the general public seemed to know of it. Now that this affair has occurred, people are trying to connect the two, and they say that the crime has something to do with your former life in Paris. The expressive features of the sick girl had changed from deepest pallor to flaming red during the last sentences. She had raised herself up in bed as if she would not lose a word of it. Her eyes rested hotly upon the mouth of her physician. She scarcely seemed to breathe. Ah, now it is all over, she cried, while tears burst from her eyes. If he should hear this, it would be too much for his jealous nature. Why did I not die yesterday? Then I should have been with my good father and my sweet mother. They would have comforted me, and I should not have known the scorn of these cruel people. The doctor was still pondering over these strange words, and was seeking some comfort to give her, when the door flew open hastily, and a tall young man rushed in. His face was very handsome, but his features were darkened by an expression of wild defiance. His eyes rolled, his hair hung loose about his forehead. He had a large roll of music in one hand, with which he gesticulated violently before he could find breath to speak. The singer cried out at his entrance. The doctor thought at first that her scream was one of fear, but he saw in a moment that it was joy, for a sweet smile had parted her lips and her eyes shone through the tears. Carlo, she cried, Carlo, are you come at last to see me? Miserable woman, cried the young man, stretching his arm with the roll of music majestically toward her. Let me hear no more of your siren song. I am come to judge you. Oh, Carlo, interrupted the singer, her voice as soft and sweet as the tones of a flute. How can you speak so to your Giuseppe? The young man was apparently preparing an answer when the doctor, who found this scene much too exciting for his patient, intervened between them. My dear Mr. Carlo, he said, offering him his snuff-box, would you kindly remember that Mademoiselle is in no condition to have her nerves played upon in such manner? The stranger turned wide eyes on him, and pointing the roll at him inquired, in a deep, threatening voice, Who are you, earthworm, that you dare intervene between me and my anger? I am court physician long, replied the latter, closing his snuff-box, and among my several titles there is nothing about an earthworm. I am master here as long as the signora is ill, and I tell you in all kindness that I will put you out unless you modulate your presto assi to a respectable larghetto. Oh, do not worry him, doctor, cried the sick woman anxiously. Do not make him angry. Carlo is my friend. He will not harm me, whatever evil tongues may have told him concerning me. Ha! You dare to mock me? But no, miserable creature, the lightning has burst the door of your secret and illumined the night in which I have been walking. Was it because of this that you would not let me know where you came from, who you were? For this reason, therefore, did you close my mouth with kisses when I would ask about your past life? Fool that I am, to let myself be charmed by a woman's voice, although I knew that it is but deception and falsity. Only in the song of man is there truth and strength. Seal, how could I let myself be carried away by the roulands of a worthless creature? Oh, Carlo, whispered the invalid, if you only knew how your words wound my heart, your suspicions strike deeper than did the murderer steal. The stranger laughed a harsh laugh. Ah, yes, indeed, my fair dove. You would wish your lovers deaf and blind. Would you not? This Parisian must have been a clever fellow to find you again so soon. This is too much, cried the doctor, catching the other by the arm. You leave this room at once, or I will call up the janitor of the house and put you out with violence. I'm going, earthworm, I'm going, cried the stranger, pushing the doctor gently down into an armchair. I am going, Giuseppe, never to return again. If you die, miserable woman, hide your soul in some corner where I can never meet you. I would curse heaven if I must share it with you. You have robbed me so cruelly of my love, of my very life. 
He gesticulated again with the roll of music, but his wildly rolling eye was dim with tears as he threw a last look at the sick girl, and then rushed sobbing from the room. "'Oh, follow him! Stop him!' cried the singer. "'Bring him back, or I shall never be happy again!' "'No, indeed, my dear young lady,' replied Dr. Lang, getting up out of his armchair. "'We must have no more such scenes here. "'I will prescribe for you some soothing drops, which you must take every hour.' "'The poor girl had sunk back in her cushions and had fainted again. "'The doctor called a servant, and they worked together to restore the patient to her senses. "'During this time the doctor could not resist the temptation to scold the serving-maid. "'Did I not tell you that nobody should be allowed to enter this room?' and here you let this crazy man in, who was near being the death of your young lady. I didn't let anybody in, answered the girl, sobbing. But I couldn't refuse him. Signora sent me to his house three times already today to implore him to come to her, if only for a moment. I was to say that she was dying, and that she must see him once more before her death. Indeed. And who is this? The sick woman opened her eyes. She looked first at the doctor, then at her servant, then her eyes wandered uneasily about the room. "'He is gone. He is gone for ever,' she whispered weakly. "'Oh, dear doctor, please go to Bull now.' "'For mercy's sake, what do you want with my poor old counsellor? This affair has already thrown him on a sick bed. How could he possibly help you?' "'I made a mistake,' she said. "'I meant you should go to my friend, the foreign orchestra leader. His name is Bologna.' and he lives in the Hotel de Portugal. I remember having heard about him, said the doctor. But what should I say to him when I see him? Tell him that I will explain everything if he will only come once more. But no, I could never tell him myself. Would you tell him, doctor? I have such confidence in you. If I told you everything, you would explain it to him, would you not? I am quite at your disposal, and will do everything I can to ease your mind. Then come back tomorrow morning. I do not feel able to talk any more today. And one more thing. Babette, give the doctor his handkerchief. The servant opened a cupboard and handed the doctor a handkerchief of yellow silk, which exhaled a strong but pleasant perfume. This is not mine, said the doctor. I only use linen handkerchiefs. You have made a mistake in the owner. But that is impossible, sir, replied the girl. We found it on the floor last night. It does not belong to any of us, and no one has been here but yourself. The doctor's eyes met those of his patient, which were resting in anxious expectation on his face. Could not this belong to someone else? he asked firmly. Show it to me, she replied anxiously. I had not thought of that. She examined the cloth and found a monogram in one corner. Her cheek paled and she began to tremble. You seem to know that name. You perhaps know also the person who has lost this handkerchief, continued Long. It might be of use to us. May I take it with me? Giuseppa seemed fighting with herself for a decision. Finally she said, Take it, even if the terrible man should come once more, and better strike my suffering heart this time. Even then, take it, doctor. Tomorrow I will explain this handkerchief and other things to you. Five. It is easy to imagine how completely this affair occupied the thoughts of Dr. Long. His extensive practice was as much of a burden to him now as it had hitherto been a delight. The many other visits he was obliged to make kept him away from the singer until quite late the following morning, in spite of his impatience to be at her bedside. But these visits were not quite an unmixed evil, for in all the different houses he could listen to what was being said about Signor Bionetta and he hoped also to be able to learn something more about her strange lover, Bologna. The opinions as to the singer were not very favorable. The judgment was all the harsher because the gossips were angry at not being able to hear anything definite about the matter. And what young and beautiful maiden, who is also successful as an artist, has not many enemies made by envy? The strange musician was little known in the city. He had come to be a little less than a year ago, and lived very quietly in a small upper room in his hotel. He seemed to be making a living by giving singing lessons and composing music. All those who knew him seemed to think that he was just a little crazy, 
but the few who had become his friends spoke of him as being very interesting, and some of them went regularly to the Hotel de Portugal for supper, to be able to listen to his delightful conversation on musical subjects. Bologna seemed to have no relatives or no intimate friends here. People did not seem to suspect his relations with the singer Bianetti. Councillor Bolnau was still ill in bed. He was much depressed and spoke incessantly of things which usually did not interest him at all. He had bought a collection of law books which he was eagerly studying. His wife said that he had read throughout the preceding night and that she had heard him moaning. His study was particularly directed towards the subject of the unjustly accused, especially such of them as had been executed, although quite innocent. He told his friend the doctor that there was much comfort in the slowness of law proceedings in Germany, for if a suit lasted ten years or more it was safer for those who were really innocent than in places where they arrested you one day and hanged you the next. When the doctor finally reached the home of the singer Bianetti, he found his patient much depressed and very unhappy. Her wound appeared to be healing well, but with her growing physical health the calmness of her soul seemed to be vanishing. "'I have been thinking over all these things,' she said. "'Is it not strange, doctor, that you should have to come into my life in this peculiar way? Two days ago I scarcely knew of your existence, and now that I am so unhappy, I have found a kind, fatherly friend in you.' "'Mademoiselle Bianetti,' replied Long. The physician has more to do by the sickbed than merely to feel the pulse, to bind up wounds, and to prescribe medicines. Believe me, when we sit alone by our patient, when we hear the inner pulse, the pulse of the soul, beating so uneasily, when we know that there are wounds to heal which cannot be seen, then the physician is lost in the friend, and we see anew the wonderful interrelation between body and soul. Yes, indeed, that is it, said Giuseppe, taking his hand. That is it, and my soul also has found its physician in you. You may have much to do for me. You may have even to appear in the courts in my name. If you are willing to make this great sacrifice for a poor girl who has no one else, then I will tell you everything. You may depend upon me for everything, said the kind old man, pressing her hand warmly. But think well before you promise. The world has cast a slur upon my reputation. It has accused judged and condemned me. Will it not throw scorn upon you when you take the part of the maligned singer, of the friendless foreigner? I am not afraid, cried the doctor ardently. And now, tell me your story. End of section 9